Welcome back to Nationwide and our tour along the Irish border. Castle Saunderson near Loch Erin commands this stretch of the border in County Cavan. Jaw-dropping in scale, it was once the seat of a powerful Anglo-Irish family called the Saundersons. When the border was drawn up after 1921, the Saundersons found themselves on the wrong side of the line. Edward Saunderson, proud Ulster man and son of first Ulster Unionist leader also Edward Saunderson, wrote to the Border Commission in an attempt to have the border redrawn so the whole domain of Castle Saunderson be transferred into Northern Ireland. As powerful as the family was, their attempts to redraw the border weren't successful and they suddenly felt betrayed and abandoned as part of what they saw was a trapped minority in the Republic of Ireland. Next, I'm following the border into the water. Here in Loch Erne, it's a challenge to keep track of it as it twists around endless islands, coves and inlets like some sort of maze. So tell me where I am. <laughs> Please, help me. You are right on the border. The Republic or Northern Ireland? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an answer. How do you draw a line up a water? Well, the river is the, the border. The river is the, is the, border, the border, is border, but uh, is the river the border or is the line up the middle of the river the border? Right, but that's the uh, this Republic? Is, this is the Republic and, and this, this is, is, this is no. the Britain, Northern Ireland. Okay. And what about, um, would this have been a busy area, you know, when smuggling was uh, Absolutely. a part of life here? This was the smuggling route for cattle. No way. Uh, cattle were brought down the old slipway there and swum across the, the, the river and into the north where they could head for the road and head for, head for the markets in Newton Butler, Lissenski and further. Because it's a narrow point. It's a narrow point and it, it's a naturally, it, it was a quiet, uh, remote area. You would see where heavier things like washing machines and elect electrical go goods were dragged up. No way. Um, boxes of alcohol, obviously. Uh, back from my father's memory, tea, tea and butter. In, large quantity go back into the war, the emergency, depending which side of the water you're on. Okay, once again, we are... Where? I'm crossing the border right now? Well... No? Yes? Yes, you have the north here, but now you have become the north here because this little hole in the reeds marks the border. So you, was, you pretty much know the, the wiggles, the squiggles, the meandering ways of the border yeah. around this neck of the woods. Um, I hope so, I hope so, but... Um, it was always possible to get it wrong <laughs> and to be caught in the wrong. And it would have to be the customs of the correct jurisdiction that might be Absolutely. placing or, their <laughs> hand on your shoulder. <laughs> or, or, or a cooperative. Okay, a cooperative, right. And now to Sean Quinn country. The mighty Quinn, as he's known in these parts, is from Derry Lynn and Fermanagh on the northern side of the border. Inheriting his father's 23-acre farm in 1973, he began extracting gravel from the property and selling it to local builders. By 2008, Quinn was Ireland's richest man with a personal wealth of 4.7 billion euro. But in 2011, he filed for bankruptcy. Local journalist Rodney Edwards showed me how one man changed the local landscape. This will be the entrance here to the glass factory. Roof tiles is down here. What's astonishing really is the impact that uh, the construction sites have made on the landscape here. Yeah, I mean, we have a very rural area here in Fermanagh, straddles the border with Cavan, and right in the middle of it, you, we have cement factories and glass factories and uh, radiator factories. There's everything here. It certainly is reflective of his ambition, and he uh, employed uh, thousands of people from the locality and beyond. He did. He, he was a big employer. Uh, I think that is probably why he has so much respect in the area um, and why uh, he, he rose in the way that he did, because he had that support. That's the HQ. Um, that is where he was based for all those years. And just on the other side, we have the canteen. It's not a canteen now, but whenever it was going, and Sean Quinn uh, used to leave his office and walk across the road with the employees and, and eat his lunch with the workers. I'd say he felt very comfortable with them. Very comfortable, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
So the, the name very much in evidence all about, really. Yeah, we're going into the south now, Anne. I mean, that's an interesting aspect of his enterprise, really, that he is truly cross-border, or was truly cross-border. We have this huge empire, north and south. It's all very, very interesting because um, you've got employees then coming from both sides of the border, and it makes everything interesting, particularly Brexit at the moment, and, and you know, and what happens for the future of, of this business that, uh, that is in two different jurisdictions. With the passage of time, Rodney, how is John Quinn viewed locally now? Yeah, well, I think at the time when he lost everything, uh, we saw public rallies, you know, we had people coming out shouting for him uh, to, 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 to get the business back, to be back where he belonged, they were saying. Um, now, uh, people do respect him, they still respect him in this area, um, you know, he's, he still can be seen around here uh, motoring about. Yeah. Um, but I just don't think it is heartfelt as it once was. The border again is on a watery course, this time separating the twin towns of Black Line in County Cavan and Bell Coo in County Fermanagh. Fearful of a return to border controls and checkpoints, last summer local women came out in force. Their colourful art installation caught the eye of passers-by and images of Soften the Border went global. Women from the two villages on either side have made cushions to soften the border literally. And local artists have made their point. They want this border to stay just as it is. Well, the women were brilliant. They engaged and, you know, we drank tea and we talked. And it was through that conversation I realised there, there really is quite a strong archery, um, you know, from one side of this village to another. Um, and that kind of natural human interaction and the kind of the problems that we all face, the challenges that we all have on a daily basis... I think from, from a female approach, it was quite practical. Do you think projects such as your project, which caught the public imagination, can affect a kind of change or a change of people's perceptions? Well, I hope we affected some change in the kind of greater public's perception through the media coverage. But locally, uh, we proved that there was an enormous amount of kind of um, interaction happening anyway. I think that's happened in the last 20 years. I mean, this would have been a, a no-go area. So it was actually very encouraging to think that the peace process has at least had some effect in small rural communities. Leitrim is the most thinly populated county in the country, with the most recent census recording a population of 32,000. The soil is poor here and difficult to farm. Tax incentives in the 1970s resulted in huge swathes of the county becoming covered in forest, and that's still the case today. Kilty Clogher is my next stop, where I'm greeted by its favourite son, Sean McDiarmada, one of the leaders of the Rising, and Susan Carton, who voices local concerns regarding the forest. We, we have this sense of an encroaching darkness coming, really. It's, it's very difficult to live in a place that has blanket forestries all around. So there is that sense that the life is being sucked out of the county and it's being replaced by trees and by Sitka spruce, not our native trees. Yeah. So it's a, it's a sad situation, really, and we hope we can do something about it. And um, you ran into problems here in the town uh, last year when you were on the verge of losing your school due to population decline, but you took a very radical approach in trying to address that. We did, and it really became apparent that the school was in danger of closing. We were down to less than 15 pupils, so we got together with, with the community and just figured what on earth we could do in two short months. So we figured we had social media on our side, and we figured that we had an active community and a very talented community who could come up with a campaign to do it. And what were you looking for from the public? Families. Right. Children. Yeah. We were short of saying we want your children. We figured there was at least one or two families in the country who had thought mm. about a country upbringing and if we could just reach out to them and get them, get to them and tell them what we had on offer. So the campaign took off and we had, I think we have had excess in excess of 300 inquiries. We offered them a night here in the Holiday Centre to come and stay and just have a look around and meet a few people. Six families moved up then Gosh. in August, made the jump. What, what an achievement for, for such a heartfelt plea in such a short time. Absolutely, we were overwhelmed with the response, really. My last stop on land is Garrison, which sits right on the northern side of beautiful Loch Melvin. And this lake, renowned for a unique range of plants and animals, 
is too tempting to resist. Right now, I'm rowing between two counties, Leitrim on my right and Fermanagh on my left. In fact, you could make that two countries, the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom. And you know what? It's hard to imagine when you're in a setting such as this that nationhood, power or politics have any role to play. And so, signing off from no man's land on the border on Loch Melvin, good evening. On Friday's Nationwide, for the final leg of our border tour, I visit Pettigo, one small village which the border literally sliced in two. In Derry, Pat Hume recalls the civil rights marches of 50 years ago. And one way of ensuring Sam comes to Donegal, to stay. Tomorrow night, there's another chance to witness the work of the emergency services up close. Shansella and Sraf, we are a cousin Erin Egendola, Echol, Sakhethlor, their trauma. Tomorrow night at a quarter past ten. Bro Cookies is coming up after the break.